Um, but yeah, like Stacy said, I've been working a lot um, with social media clients. Uh, my background is PR, but obviously that became like really extinct a long time ago. Like everything is just social media now. Um, so I started doing a lot of social media for clients, um, doing launch parties for people like Kanye West, um, John Legend, all of these kind of people. And then I kind of started building my own Instagram on the side. So I wouldn't say now that I'm like a big, big influencer. I have only like 20 something thousand followers, but it's something that I do for a lot of clients. Like I work with a lot of celebrity influencers um, that obviously I'm not allowed to say who, but um, it's a big, big thing now. Like how many of you guys here are on Instagram? Yeah, like all of you. <laughs> and how many of you want to actually be an influencer, like make money from it? Okay, a few. I was kind of hoping for more because that's what the whole talk's about. But, um, you know, I won't be offended if you leave then. Um, so in terms of, like, knowing what an influencer is, like, with background, I mean, I know a lot of you guys do the advertising, so you know that um, traditionally, like, a lot of companies would deal with celebrities that promote their product or they kind of pay them to sponsor them and stuff. So influencer is really just another version of that. Um, but it's really like, if being an influencer is something that you really want to be serious about, then the best advice is probably to like find your niche. Um, the more you can narrow it down and be really, really specific, the better. So like, rather than just, you know, like wanting to be a beauty influencer or a fashion influencer, be like a real specific influencer, like, you know, go with darker skin tone beauty influencer. That's huge right now. Or just, you know, find your own little path. Um, let's see. So one of the reasons now why a lot of brands uh, will actually work with influencers is it's more cost effective. So like, you know, if a celebrity like George Clooney, whoever does that coffee thing, I think he's paid something like 40 million a year, which is obviously ridiculous. So a lot of the influencers now, like they've built their uh, niche audience who trust the products promoted by them. So for a brand to come along, you're going to find this a lot in advertising that your jobs are, if that's the way you go, that your jobs are going to have to have a lot of um, influencer management now. A lot of them have, you know, like hundreds and thousands of followers and it's like direct target market. So rather than having to do campaigns or like social media paid marketing, you can just go to an influencer. It's your direct target market and you can just give them free product and maybe a depending on how many followers they have, like maybe a few hundred dollars and you're done. Um, so now I think uh, small, medium influencers are now seen to be bigger because a lot of the influencers now that have maybe million or like, I think Kim Kardashian has something like 180 million, something crazy followers now, but a lot of brands don't want to use that. They want like small to medium, which would be like 15 to 25,000 followers. So that is seen as being a lot more trustworthy. So that's kind of like where that's all going right now. Um, so just to kind of get an idea of what these people are making, like Taylor Swift, not a fan of her, but I mean, even her Diet Coke campaign got her $26 million. And I believe that was just a one year campaign. Um, 50 cents on here, he's making 100 million, uh, 60 to 100 million with vitamin water, which is weird, but I think apparently he owns it. Uh, George Clooney, uh, Nespresso, 40 million. So these are the kind of deals that literally they're starring in maybe what, like 10 ads or something, and they're making this kind of money, which is kind of obscene. Um, there's another one I think I use like, Penelope Cruz is an example. So she's making two million a year with L'Oreal. And then if you actually look at her site, so on her Instagram, she's got like 4.3 million followers. But do any of you guys here know how to check like how much money you can make from Instagram? Do you know about the calculator? Okay. So <clears throat> on this, if you go to Influencer Marketing Hub, um, you can actually figure out if you enter in uh, your username, you can find out what people are making. So if there's like people that you're interested in, celebrities, whatever, you can put their name in there, you click search and it will tell you exactly what you make per post. Um, so we can look at that in a second and we can see like, mine is pretty lame. I think mine's like $200 a post or something at the moment. Um, let 
me see. So one, I think one interesting one, especially for you guys, like if you were going to do a um, campaign with like sports guy, like Usain Bolt, I mean, he's on 10 million a year. So you can see kind of now the when you search him in the Instagram hub, you can actually see like what he would make. So he would make 30 grand just from a post. So let's say like um, Puma don't want him to like do the whole annual sponsorship anymore. He could actually, they could send him products and all he has to do is send a picture of him wearing a pair of Puma trainers or whatever tracksuit and he can charge them 30 grand. So that's obviously like the biggest scale. If you're looking to start out, you're not going to start on those kind of numbers. It takes time and it, it's a little tedious. Like who here gets annoyed having to post every day on Instagram and think of cool things to write and find the hashtags? It's a pain in the ass, right? It really is. I feel like I'm talking to myself, but I'm just going to, I'm going to go with it. <laughs> um, so if you're actually serious, like that is a definite, the best advice anyone could ever give to you is to find that niche. Um, like I was saying before, if you're going to be, you know, like a travel influencer, don't just say your travel because that's such a huge thing. There's like millions and millions of people doing the same thing as you, but you could pick a niche and have like luxury or glamping or camping. There's just ways of doing it where you really hone down your target market. And that's what brands are looking for. Um, and the same side, like if a lot of you are going to work in advertising, you want to be really specific. Like if you're going to have to reach out and work with influencers, then you need to know like exactly the kind of people that you want to get so that you'll get in the right target market. Because you don't want to be sending free product, free whatever, or like sending them all of this free stuff and then getting nothing in return. Um, and you want to look out as well for like the people that are buying fake followers. It's still a massive problem, but you can tell. Um, so the website I gave you before, the Influencer Marketing Hub, you can run, if you want to work with influencers, you can run the kind of stats through there. And if they have, you know, like 100,000 followers, but they're getting like 100 likes per post, they're fake. There's no way. Um, the math just doesn't work out. Who here ever brought fake followers? Lies. I know so I know at least one person did. A hundred percent. Like we all did it years ago until it became like very uncool. And it doesn't matter, like I think now it's a big issue because it will affect your engagement rate, but a lot of people still do it. I don't know why, because every time we have like the purge thing on Instagram, um you're gonna lose all those followers. So it's a total waste of your time and it's gonna make you look really inauthentic and it could really damage your chances actually of working with brands. So as well, I mean, we hear it all the time and it's like nothing new, but if you're gonna be an influencer, you really have to tell a story that resonates with your audience. So your bio, like every image, every caption has to be really brand tone. It has to be engaging. Um, now we have like, I think every month, Instagram update their algorithm, which means that you are really fighting to get that attention from people. Like they're just making it harder and harder and harder for us to get like likes and for anyone that's interested in the nerdy side of it, apparently Instagram just released some info this week saying that they're actually going to start hiding likes so that people stop obsessing over it, which could change the whole influencer thing because that's the whole point in them. Um, but that's like the latest thing that they're trying to do to mess with us. So if like, for those of you that are actually serious about wanting to start influencer, like there are some ways that I can... Um, show you to actually start and like agencies that you can join and stuff where you can, I think from like two to 5,000 followers, you can start getting involved. Um, you can get like free products and you can post about the free products. It's a really good way to start and kind of start getting your foot in that door. Um, there's other ways, like if you, if it's something that you really want to do and you know exactly the kind of brands that you want to work with, if you already have those kind of brands in your house, just post about them like they're already paying you. And eventually those brands will come to you and offer you like, if not free product, then they'll give you money per post, like whatever. Um, Muses is a really good app to sign up with. If you sign up with them, they will actually uh, send you the products and all you have to do is make a post in return. 
it's really easy, it gets your foot in the door, and that's how you can start your whole influencer journey. So I think one thing that I talk to people a lot about, like one thing that brands always come to me for help with is the growth hacking. Um, who here know, knows what growth hacking is? Okay, so you're familiar. So <clears throat> with um, Instagram, like there's a lot of ways now where people got so fed up trying to grow. Like there's a hundred rule where you can like a um, hundred photos a day or like follow a hundred people in your target market every day but that's gonna take you months to get that law of reciprocation and like get maybe 20 followers a day. Like it's just not the same kind of growth. So there's a lot of agencies now where you can find someone pretty reputable where you could, that you'll be paying like $300 a month, um, but you could get anywhere between three to 5,000 new followers a month. Um, if that's something like you don't have budget for in the starting days and it really is a case of like, committing hours and hours a day to just following those accounts and engaging with them. The more you engage, if you comment on certain brands and influencers every day, like they will reciprocate. And that's how you kind of start that whole influencer journey. Um, one thing that you should definitely have, if you're like really want to go into influencer, then when you hit maybe like 10,000 followers or even before, maybe five to 10, you wanna create a media card that you can just easily send out to people. Um, and that should really feature like a little bit about you, um, how many followers you have and how much engagement you have. That's one thing that brands really wanna find now. Like fine, you may have like 100,000 followers, but if you only have 1% engagement rate, that means like you're not getting very many likes and comments and no one really cares what you're promoting. Who has questions? <laughs> Go for it. Hey, um, other than uh, purchasing fake followers, what are some things that um, influencers also get wrong that would kind of disqualify them in your eyes? Ah, good question. I think one of them is probably using um, spammy hashtags. So you know, it's like just kind of online etiquette now, if you're gonna put uh, the hashtags in the post, you dot, 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 but brands will look at the kind of hashtags you're, that you're actually using. So if you're gonna use a bunch of spammy ones like like for like, follow Friday, you know, all of those comment for comment, those are kind of frowned upon. Um, also one thing that like drives us insane, I did a big influencer event with um, Jamie Foxx in, I believe it was November, and so many influencers were invited to this event. It was such a simple thing. Uh, all they had to do was like tag the brand and put who they were there for. And like, I think maybe only 10% of them did that, which means we're never using them again. It was a waste of our time. Um, I think it's just taking like really paying attention to detail. So, you know, if you agree to post for them, you have to include all of that stuff they requested, like the hashtags, the brand hashtags, you know, it's just taking time to do it properly because it's such an easy mistake. Um, but now like not, including those hashtags and the stuff is gonna have them blacklisted. Thank you. <laughs> Front row. Go for it. I don't know if, if it's relevant. Um, is there certain times that you would recommend to post? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think if you have a business Instagram account, then you can use insights that will tell you like when your followers are most active. Um, but, I mean, there's all different times, but generally 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. is usually a pretty good time um, to post if you want to go with, like, consistent. Lunch time. Uh -huh. It's a lunch time? Yeah, lunch time seems to work really well. Um, more kind of entrepreneurs that I work with, they find that 6 a.m. works really well because that's when their kind of target Wait, market are up. So it's kind of trial and error, but I would say 12 p.m., 1 p.m. is always, like, a really good, solid kind of time. What about hashtags? 
Hashtags, um, for those, I mean, I would always say, like, you have to use a combination, so you don't want to just be using, like, massive hashtags that everyone's using, because the whole point in the hashtags is that um, you want to be featured in the first top nine uh, posts when someone searches that hashtag. So the problem with, like, you know, if you're going for a hashtag that millions and millions of people are using, you're just never going to show up there. Um, so you want to kind of go for hashtags that are a little bit more, bit more niche. Like if it was fashion, you might want to go for like streetwear, those kind of hashtags that kind of really describe like your brand and your target market so that those people are finding you. Um, and if you're starting to get, you know, in the top nine posts, like every time someone searches that hashtag, they're going to find you. Um, I think now, I mean, a lot of experts say different stuff that you should only use 11 hashtags now, but we still use up to 30 per post, but definitely like put them in the first comment section or put the dot, 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 just so that your yeah, messages right. don't look really spammy. Um, just in terms of like creating an eye-pleasing page. I've heard it's trendy now, not like don't use them at all. Yeah, that's like a new thing, but I mean, if you're someone like Kim Kardashian that has like, I forget exactly her number, but it, it's like a hundred and something million followers. With someone, when you're at that level, you don't have to. Like, I think Beyonce started that whole thing. Um, I mean, she doesn't need to, you know what I mean? Like, she knows who her fans are. They're gonna, she's gonna get like a million likes per post anyway, so she doesn't really care. Um, but I would say like now, it's not really good practice, you know? Um, until you are at that level, like you need your target market to find you. I would say always use them. Thank you. <laughs> So I've seen a lot of profiles that have like the verified um, batch and they're not even like public figures or they don't have a lot of engagement and stuff, but they do get verified. What's the probability that you would like get verified if you have like articles online and you have like a business that can be like damaged whenever they do like fake profiles and stuff? Wait, say that one again because my hearing is... Terrible. Like, I've seen a lot of profiles that have, uh -huh. like, verified, you know, that the profile is verified with the, oh, with the, the blue, blue thing. Tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but they're not even, like, public figures or nothing like that. So, what's the possibility, like, the probabilities for you to get a verified that account? That one, it's actually a really good question because I've been trying to get my one verified for a while, but it's not even, like, about the amount of followers you have. It's to do with, like, your kind of line of work and stuff. So at some point soon, they're just going to have to give in and verify me um, because, you know, law of persistence, if you annoy them enough, they're just going to do it. Um, but I think a lot of people that I work with now have their brands and stuff verified. I mean, you can actually do it through the Instagram app now, through the settings. Um, but it can take time, but it's more about, like, if you're a public figure... Or um, I think, like, a friend of mine just got his verified because he was on that Bachelor TV show. Um, so, obviously, a lot of people may want to, you know, like, pretend to be him online or whatever. Um, but it is, it's a process. Um, but if you keep, like, persisting with it, then it's definitely, like, doable. I had two of the brands I worked with got uh, verified in January. Um, it's doable. <laughs> What can you comment about like posting captions in different languages? Maybe if your audience speaks both Spanish or English, mm -hmm. do you think first like how to reach your audience, maybe not trying to avoid the other one? Like first Spanish, first English, how would you do it? That and again, you guys ask really good questions. Like that actually comes up a lot. I think the class that I just taught on Thursday, a lot of the class uh, want to do in Spanish and English. So you can kind of separate, like someone was saying, um, it's quite a cool idea, you just use the flag. Um, I don't think it's really a, an issue. I think, um, I mean, I follow a lot of influencers that I did a New Year's Eve event with in Miami, and a lot of them only post in Spanish, so I never know what they're talking about, but we have the translate thing. Um, but if you want to really like build that community feel, you can definitely do both, but maybe just separate them with the flags just so that it's really obvious to people. I think that's workable. Thank you. Um, I read a thing that said that before, like, 
shorter captions were better, but mm -hmm. now longer captions, according to the algorithm, the longer people spend on your post, like the more reach you get. Mm -hmm. So what is your take on like caption length? I think um, it really comes down to like your brand. Um, so I know we were talking a lot about your account and the class on Thursday. I think... I always think it's good to do a mixture because I follow certain people that honestly, like I'm immediately turned off when I see an essay every single post. Like I don't want to read all that crap because most of the time it's not even interesting. It's just like, you know, like a, a huge essay of opinions. Um, but I think it's good to mix it up. You can have like a cool caption, you know, that's just really short and snappy right to the point. And then sometimes you can post longer ones. Um, I think now, like, with the, there's always these different rumors going around with the algorithm stuff, so I think now for a comment to actually be valid, like, to be kind of looked at by the algorithm, it has to be four plus words. Um, so that's where now, like, a lot of people used to be, like, comment a emoji that explains your mood today or whatever. So that's why a lot of influencers have stopped doing that now, because obviously it's not, like, helping them move up um, in favor with the algorithm. But I would, I definitely think you can do short and long. Don't do all long, <laughs> for sure. Okay, one more. <laughs> so I recently saw that right now with the new algorithm and all that stuff, that only 10% of your followers are seeing your posts. Is that, is that like real or not? Say that again. That I, I just saw that right now with the new algorithm, that only 10% of your followers are seeing your posts. Is that, yeah, I yeah. mean, I think when um, a lot of like people that work in my industry, social media and stuff, when we found out that Facebook were purchasing Instagram, no one was happy about it because we knew, okay, this is what they're going to do. They're going to close it down now. So like the free ride is over in an effect. Like they did exactly the same with that with Facebook. So I think they are definitely hiding it. Like if you notice that you like someone's picture, um, like today, you'll, all of a sudden you're seeing loads of uploads from them. Um, so it definitely does um, have that thing with the algorithm. Like if you don't like someone's post for like a week or something or two weeks, you might find that you're not seeing stuff from them anymore unless you physically go to their page, um, which obviously isn't good. Um, but you know, like, the algorithm changes all the time. Like what works today might not work next week. It's kind of like ongoing trial and error all the time. It's like a game without the fun. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, so as far as my understanding, like the whole idea of like non-celebrity people on social media, like with a large following, like kind of started on Vine with like Nash Greer, Thomas Sanders, Logan Paul, those kind of people. And then eventually they start to like get paid by brands to promote stuff. And then that kind of transferred to Instagram once Vine like died. My question is where, like when did the word influencer start being used and like why that particular word to describe that kind of person? I guess, you know what, I think a lot of times when a uh, brand started realizing that there were certain people that were, you know, like went from YouTube or whatever, those kind of video websites and were actually starting to use Instagram to build a really strong following. I guess that's where they kind of created that word. Okay, this person has like 50,000 followers and they're all in the beauty niche. She's now a beauty influencer. But it kind of seems to have come out from nowhere because I think it's only like the last three years or something and now it's like, it's huge. It's kind of like almost done to death now. Um, but now that we have like the micro influencers as well, which is like the 10, 10 to 20,000 followers. So I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, because like that was kind of like why I asked the question. Because like if there's so many like influencers mm -hmm. and like everyone's like an influencer, like, so, like some of the people who do that, like they actually have like hundreds of thousands of followers and like yep. they have like huge impacts on certain things. And other people, it's like they post a lot about one thing and they get paid for it. But like as far as like actual like influence, like that's kind of, I don't know, it's like, it's, it's, it's a little bit strange to me. It is, it's a weird setup. I mean, now um, we kind of changed our whole, a lot of the brands that I work with, we had to change our whole marketing strategy because now, okay, like where we would have had to spend X amount of money on getting this celebrity involved and posting about us and whatever, like we now have a clear line. Okay, let's just message like 100 influencers today that have, 
about a quarter of a million followers and send them this uh, gift basket of products. So the amount of money that you save dealing with the influencers is insane, but like you said, there's also this other kind of, sometimes I look at an influencer profile and they say they're an influencer, but they don't seem to be talking about anything in particular. So those are the ones that we don't want to work with. <laughs> those like the Instagram models or whatever um, that don't really kind of serve any purpose in that sense. Um, but there'll probably be like another type of influencer coming out this year as well. <laughs> Just you. to make it more confusing. Thank you. <laughs> You're gonna have to start running to be more dramatic. <laughs> Do you think there's a big difference between the engagement on Instagram stories now versus just regular posts on Instagram? Um, I would say, yeah. I think um, stories is something we really started doing for a lot of brands and stuff last year, because especially when Instagram uh, introduced the fact you can put hashtags in the stories now, mm -hmm. I mean, that makes a huge difference. I did a story for one of the celebrities I worked with like last week and their views were like six fold up just from one hashtag I used, which was beauty or something. So, um, I mean, depending on what you guys, like if you want to be influenced in, in a certain niche, I would definitely be using um, like up to the 10 hashtags in every single story. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes like people are lazy, you know what I mean? Like we don't always want to have to go and read through stuff like the people that always like to air their opinions, like where we can just go to stories and watch people. It's like that secret door into people's lives. Mm -hmm. We're all just like voyeurism, whatever. <laughs> and do you say, do you think there's like a limit to like how many like stories a day are appropriate and like keep people's um, attention? I wouldn't, I don't know if there would like be a limit, but that's interesting question again, because like one of the models that I work with, I think she does too much. I mean, literally from like the moment yeah. she gets up in the morning and has breakfast, like, believe me, it's all going on stories. I know what you had for breakfast. I know what, like how milky your tea is. Like, I don't want to see that, <laughs> you know, yeah. not every day. Um, but I think if you have like three or four like video and then maybe some behind the scenes stuff, maybe like a brand image, but with stories and stuff, like the whole trick to Instagram now is making everything not salesy, even though we're trying to sell stuff. It's kind of backward, but you know, like you'll notice if you go into certain profiles and they're just pushing, pushing, pushing their product, it's kind of a turn off now, like it's just not seen as cool. Now that you say that, do you think the Instagram TV is also going to be turning off people from like staying um, engaged or do you think that's going to help brands? To be honest, like I've been kind of like sitting around waiting to see what's going to happen with that because I use it for a lot of the celebrities I work with because some of them are like public speakers and entrepreneurs. So for that, it's great. Um, I guess like if you were just starting the influencer journey, it may not be as relevant. Um, but I think for bloggers, it's probably a really good idea. Well, one thing I want you to talk about, Sophie, uh, we went on vacation together last May to the Cayman Islands, and there were these two six-year-olds there who did not have to pay for a week at the Ritz. We had to pay. These girls did not have to pay. They were, who are these girls again? You know the whole story. Oh, I think they're called like the, the Stoffer family. Stoffer? But these little kids, six-year-old kids, got a week at the Ritz in Grand Cayman Island for free the whole week. The whole thing free. Oh, wait. But that's where, like, I think, because I sent you a post from the mom, like, yeah. I find it kind of weird now, like, it's kind of borderline. It was cute, it was like some viral video came out of the kid at first, um, and she was, like, trying to voice her opinion and put the world to rights. That was cute, but now it's like the whole profile is like that. And it's kind of like, what she was just saying something really weird, right? Like, yeah, but she was like, I don't want to be one of those people at... Coachella with showing my crotchella. That was it. And she's like three years old. Yeah, to me, it's just weird. Really weird. But um, I think the mom was like a photographer. I mean, the Insta kids now are kind of like killing it. So it was kind of like a weird moment to like be standing next to these kids that make more money than this, like all of us put together. <laughs> but more power to them. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you go about quality control posts? So you're working with a, 10 different influencers for one campaign, mm -hmm. and you want to keep a similar aesthetic depending on your mood board, but mm -hmm. you're giving the influencers creative direction on what they post on their thing. How do you create like this streamlined quality control? 
Um, I think, I mean, a lot of the time, I was trying to think, so I did an influencer event on New Year's Eve in Miami, so I had to drive a, um, a supercar into a dance floor. It was really fun. Uh, I may have crashed the car a little bit. Um, but stuff like that, they actually gave me a contract. Uh, they'd be like, you can't do this, you can't edit the photo, um, you can't put this, like, you can't put anything negative, no profanity. So, like, you can, you know, if you're going to work with brands and influencers, you can have a contract um, that kind of stops them from posting anything really negative that would then be associated with your brand. And how often do you see, like, an audience being burnt out from an influencer? So is it smart to get uh, an influencer in, like, in a retainer agreement, or should you do one-off post? To be honest, I think it's all very, um, it depends on like the influencer. I think a lot of the ones that I work with, um, they're sometimes like happy just with free product. Other ones, you know, like the, the website that I showed, the influencer marketing, I think they call it the Instagram engagement calculator or something. Um, but something like that, you can actually put in to see how much you're worth based on like followers and you can do it with brands as well. It's a really good way of like setting a price and then having kind of like a bargaining place to start. A lot of brands actually don't like to pay. Um, so another company that I work with, we, we have a beauty brand, so we actually pay the influencers, but they have like, you know, 100, 200,000 followers and they have to do a lot of work for that. They have to do like an entire tutorial with the products and stuff. And one last question. Say you're trying to make the end goal of a campaign is to make sales on a product and you're using influencers for promotion mm -hmm. or whatnot. Is it better to spread it out? Say you want five influencers today, another five the next month, or should you try to do it all in one day and try to get the mass traction for one, um, a certain day? That probably, again, like depends on your campaign objectives. Like If you just want to blitz it and get really um, build your brand awareness as quickly as possible, then you could just do it all in one day. I guess one bonus of that is like, you know, I keep using beauty as an example, but if you had like 20 beauty influencers, one of them that's following one is probably following a lot of them because it falls into something like they're interested about. So if you imagine you do like a blitz and they see your product 20 times in one day, I think they say what you guys would know better than me, like people have to see something five times before they buy it online or something along those lines. Um, so yeah, you can kind of make that executive decision, like you can trial and error it if you're not in a race again, it's time, you could maybe do three influences this month, try a different three next month, and then kind of track the results, see how much actual like reach and engagement you got from that. Gotcha, thank you. What do you think about the grid, like the design, do you think it has to make sense, it has to be artistic? or it doesn't matter? Um, I think that really comes down to what industry you're in and what you're trying to be known for. Um, I think if you're going to be a brand, it definitely, the brand has to be all the same, like brand tone. Um, like someone I work with, he does a lot of photography stuff, but he's, his style is very much like, you know, that New York black and white everything. So his posts are mainly like black and white. So you definitely have to have like a strong brand tone in there and you can get really creative with it um, as well. But I think in terms of like everything having to be like amazing, I think people now, it like changed last year, people are kind of turned off by too many professional photos now because it's just not real, like it's not real life. Um, so you can definitely kind of mix it up, you know, if you're going to have like one behind the scenes video or something, you could, it really depends like the kind of mood that you want to project and the kind of brand tone you're trying to get out there. But you know, like, for example, someone posted like a picture of the beach, then mm -hmm. a picture of her at the beach, let's say, and a picture that is exactly the same beach, mm -hmm. you know, like to make that kind of like design, but those pictures are empty actually, you know, like the one that makes yeah. sense and has more likes is the one in the middle but it gives like a sense of design to the whole grid. Do you think that's valuable or? Um, yeah, I mean, that's something that, it's kind of like that constant ongoing war because I have the same thing like with my account. Um, sometimes I don't want to post that picture, it's boring. However, like you said, it goes with the grid and no other picture I have is going to go with that. Um, so yeah, sometimes you find out, you know that you're posting something, you know it's not going to get a likes, but half of the war is like trying to keep that consistency so that you're not disappearing from people's um, notifications. Next question. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so all the influencers are human. Huh? Have all the influencers have been human? Um, not all influencers make payment. Um, I think especially when people first start out and you're kind of finding your feet, it's a lot of it is just free product, but then you also get some influencers like the ones with 500, I would say quarter of a million around that upwards. They're not going to post stuff for free unless they really like you or unless you give them a bunch of free products. Um, then that's kind of when the payment comes in, but that, that depends on like your engagement and how many followers you have and that's all calculated and you kind of, you have to have that agreement with a brand before the, you know, they pay you. Like I just recently had Salt Life Beer pay me randomly, put some money in my account so that I post about them, which I have to do at some point. Uh, but you can, I mean, it, it becomes really fun, but it, it's really like nice point when you get to a, a stage where you don't, you can be really picky about the brands you work with because for some reason, like this year, my email has just gone insane. Like I have people emailing me every day asking me to post this or post that. Um, and for something like for your age groups, like it's something that's so easy for you guys. I would say just jump in and try and get free stuff from everyone. You said you need a, <laughs> a certain amount of uh, followers for that, right? Say again? You, you say you need to have already like a, a certain amount of followers for that? Yeah. To start asking um, brands and stuff? So I think oh. you can probably start, like, join an influencer agency. You can probably join with, like, two and a half thousand because they're always looking for littler people, like, influencers as well. Um, but really and truthfully, a lot of the brands that send out, like, scope, from what I've seen, the, the going rate is normally a minimum of 10,000 followers. Do you know of any case where, like, you don't have the followers... But if they see the potential, you will work something out? It's something, I mean, if it's something that you really want to do, like, you know, it, it would mean that you have to commit that time to getting the followers, like, either organically by spending, like, hours a day following people and liking their stuff, or, like, you know, investing in growth hacking and then just let someone take care what of it for you. What about just going to the street and, like, asking each person you see to follow you? Say again? What about just, like, going through the street and, like, Asking each person you see to follow you, would that be like a okay strategy? Like, you could. I mean, one way, like you guys are in a really good position because obviously you're like studying advertising, right? So you could get really creative with it. Like, you could do a massive event. Uh, everyone gets into the event for free, but only if at the door they follow you on Instagram or something. Like, you can get really um, creative with it. Like, I had someone do that back in London, um, and I think she threw a massive party in this private members club, and that was literally the only thing you had to do to get in was to like follow them on Instagram, and it got her like a thousand uh, followers that night. And she started doing that every weekend. So you can get creative with it. There's other ways of doing it, and if you're using like all the stuff that you've learned from advertising, you could probably nail it a lot quicker than I did. Okay, and one last question. So do you think uh, if I, Let's say the person that is being uh, shown, or the thing that is being shown as an influencer, if it is shown in a ter third perspective, like talking about him rather than him talking, so he wouldn't, who, he wouldn't exactly have a voice. But like, you'll be. Do you think he will affect it, or like, if he is talked about in like a third person type of way? Do I don't like, think do you so. You get what I'm saying? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I like your hat. <laughs> Just curious, was it Annabelle's? Yeah. <laughs> How do you know? Yes. Um, any other questions? We have a question in the back. Run. Let's say one Hi. Um, whenever you run a campaign for a brand, how is it that you select um, those influencers you're going to use? Do you have a platform for that? And how do you measure the impact that it took after? You mean, like, how do I create a strategy for them? No, no, no. How you choose who you're going to work with? Is there, like, some sort of tool that you can pick? or do you You're going to have to shout a little everybody? bit, babe, because oh. that, that thing outside, like, I can't hear anything. Sorry. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Project. Okay. I was asking, whenever you go pick the influencers you're going to use for a campaign, 
Um, how do you select them? Do you just go through everybody and pick whatever works best? Do you have a tool for that? And then how do you measure the impact of that campaign? They have, so now there are actually a lot of uh, new tools coming out where you can, uh, different software, I think Hootsuite just designed some entire um, software where you can actually check like how popular they are and it pulls like a million different stats and it will suggest which influencers you should work with based on like what their followers are interested in, what their followers are posting about, what their followers are liking. Like it's really in depth, like crazy systems. Um, that one is, it's Hootsuite, but it's like for a paid account. So I would have to try and figure out what good one is a free one. And then I'll email Stacy. I have to think, I want to find out about that too, because I want to be on all those agencies and I don't even have to talk to anyone anymore. It's perfect. <laughs> so with the word influencer comes risk. A risk that potentially would, um, any post or anything that an influencer might say could possibly offend a lot of people. Yeah. Um, have you had those experiences and if yes, how do, you, how do they, those influencers bounce back? Or what is the situation like? So, I think like, I mean, I haven't had too much of that stuff because we're always like so careful about what we post. But there was something recently, like one of the celebrities that I work with, um, I wanted to put something cute. It was like her grandchild's um, birthday. It was just a really cute image of him. He's this gorgeous little kid. Um, so I put something like the caption was going to be like, good morning, ladies, or something. But I was like, you know what? We can't even post that because there would be a backlash. Well, how do you know he's only two years old? How do you know he's going to like ladies? Maybe he's going to like boys. I'm like, I'm not even dealing with that. Like, just the thought of the kind of think like negative backlash I mean people are kind of stupid sometimes like you know especially on things like Instagram they can hide they don't have to you know like everyone's opinionated when they're behind their computer and so you get people posting it all the time like a lot of the rich kind of celebrities I work with uh, some of the comments they get is like they're awful um, but you just you kind of delete that I think if you post something that really um, offends someone like you know like the obvious ones would be around like re religion or that kind of stuff the kind of the typical ones where people get very heated it's always better to kind of play it safe and kind of you know always have the client approve stuff before you post it so if there is a backlash it's not just on you it's on them too um, but I think the, the way of like dealing with it is probably just owning it, you know? Like, I think there's been a lot of situations, like if you Googled brands that kind of came out on top after like dealing with a massive backlash, you could probably find some really cool examples. I think it's really just owning it and then doing it with a little bit of humor is just kind of like pointing fun at it, for sure. Um, what if when there's no brand involved, uh, inf a lot of influencers who are aspiring influencers, for example, um, Brands don't know them, brands haven't approached them yet or something. And even though they might be really, really big with a big, a large follower base, um, how do they assess this or stay away from that risk? I mean, of course, you said uh, just try to play it safe. But um, um, yeah, I mean, one thing is like personally with certain influences, I'll look at everything. Um, so we had a situation, I think it was last year, we had a beauty blogger who had put some like really negative things in captions previously, like the year before, and a couple of them probably could have been like defined more as like blatant all out racism. I'm like, we're not working with her because you can't like in this day and age, especially as an influencer post stuff, knowing that that's really gonna be taken the wrong way because you're trying to be controversial. So either you're trying to get a reaction out of people or you're just stupid. So either way, you don't really wanna work with people like that. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much, Sophie, for a great thank presentation. You guys.